Today I shall talk about design of the workplace, most precisely the office environment and its design in relation to the environment, issues, green technology and future HR demands. Before I start, I'd like to thank the organizer of iGEM 2014 for giving me this opportunity to be here today. I hope that this session shall bring the best benefit to everyone. Since the audience is small, I shall keep this session simple and not too formal. A bit about myself first and architect Chris Yap, my co-presenter. Uh, I'm an architect by profession, been practicing interior designers for 26 years. I've been in the industry for th over 35 years. I'm a founding member of the Malaysian Institute of Interior Designers where I was elected as president twice. I'm also a founding member of the Malaysian Institute of Interior Designers. I, currently, I'm serving on the committee of the Green Building Index Interior Tools Committee. Okay, a bit about Chris Yap. Architect Chris Yap is a president, the current president of the Malaysian Institute of Interior Designers. He's also an architect, registered ID, retail designer for over 30 years. He runs his own architectural practice and ID firm. Architect Chris Yap's involvement in professional bodies such as the Pudobahan Architect Malaysia, MID, and the Malaysian Green Building Confederation shows his concern for the continuous development of these professions within the building fraternity. He's also a fellow of both PAM and MID. Both Chris and me are co-founders of the Malaysian Institute of Interior Designers. This is part of our passion to actively pursue interior design and excellence in the profession. Before I continue, I'd like to know a bit more about the profile of audience here today. Can I know how many of you are interior designers? Any interior designers? Looks like no. Contractors, builders, no either. Suppliers, students, thank you. Okay, my talk today is basically divided into four simple sections. Section one, who? I'm going to give a brief introduction of MID, including the Institute's vision and activities. Section two, what? I shall share some insights of the interior design industry in Malaysia and basic requirements, procedure for the Green Building Index certifications. Section three, why? We shall look into some of the most important environmental issues like challenges and impacts on the way we design our built environment, as well as some example of good practice. I shall also share some tips, the do's and don'ts in making responsible green choices. Four, the future. I shall go through some possible emerging types of jobs or professions in the future, new workplace requirements and the influence on the design trends of the office. Dreaming green. So to start, I like everyone here to think about the, green, the dream space. Where would it be? In the forest? In the mountains? Downtown? How would the space look like? The color? the fabric, the smell. But in reality, it's something quite different. Introduction to MID. Interior designers, we dream of uh, creating spaces that are both beautiful and functional, that shall enhance people's life, inspiring them in their everyday lives. Interior designers, project managers, architects, engineers, procurement advisors, and others who play a part in organizing, designing, and construction of projects have important roles in finding their balance between the needs for comfort in a demanding and ever-increasing, continuously helping to ensure a healthy and environmentally sound interior environment. With this dream, Interior Designers of Malaysia created Malaysian Institute of Interior Designers, MSID, in 1989, while architects who were also practicing interior design created the Institute of Institute Breaker Bentuk Dalaman in 1990. 
As the demand of quality space increases, the need for one strong body that governs a whole Malaysian interior design profession and industry becomes stronger. Both institutes then agreed to merge and form one single body, which is the Malaysian Institute of Interior Designers. Visions of the Institute. 2014 marks the mid-third year of the MID official existence since 2012. MID is blessed by the presence of so many professionals and renowned personalities who have also previously served in this parent organization, MSID and IPDM. We have just held our third annual AGM recently and we're pleased to acknowledge that the Institute's strong leadership has been ensured by visionary visions of its member. One of the visions of the Institute is to develop a sophisticated society of Malaysians who are conversant and appreciative of creative world of interior design. Despite being a very young, MID is taking up the challenge of making interiors more sustainable. As part of the responsibility of the Institute, representing the interior design profession in Malaysia. To this end, the Institute conducts various programs throughout the year to educate, promote, and foster ties between the public and professional body alike. MID Record Conference. MID Record Conference, an international conference created to provide for MID's members, as well as people in the interior industry, a premium event where renowned speakers will be brought in to deliver lecture, discourse on design in general and in emphasis on interior design. MID record session, which is a series of monthly talks to our members, but prominent leading designers locally and from overseas. These sessions are meant to be small and intimate, providing exposure for our members and giving a platform for leading designers to provide an insight of the design approach and philosophy. Next, MID Record Awards. MID Record Awards, which have been instrumental in the Institute effort to further enhance and elevate the standards of interior design in Malaysia. Some of the Record Awards' previous winners have expressed their appreciation to be selected, as has strengthened their profile and reputation industry. The Record Awards has thus become the benchmark of excellence in Malaysian interior design profession. IFI 26th General Assembly and Congress 2014. I'm also proud to share that MID won the bid to host the prestigious 26th IFI General Assembly and Congress, as well as to celebrate IFI 50th anniversary and hosted the event from 1st to 5th of March 2014. IFI stands for the International Federation of Interior Architects, Designers, and the global voice and authority for the profession interior designers, architects, often considered as the United Nations of interior design field. The preparation of this event was compressed as a normal preparation period was four years. MID have little over six months to prepare this event, and this achievement became the first country in Southeast Asia to host such an event for IFI. The preparation one of the highlights of the event was the signing ceremony of the IFA interior declaration between the Mayor of KL, the Honorable Datuk Sri Haji Ahmad Fiza, and the then President of IFI. IMID has the IFI interior declaration translated into Bahasa Malaysia. The declaration has thus far been translated into 10 languages around the globe. The city of Kuala Lumpur now joins global cities like Nagoya, Montreal, and New York in the adoption of the IFI Interiors Declaration. With the adoption, the city of Kuala Lumpur proclaims the recognition of interior architecture, design as a fundamental value and a driving force for the advancement of humanity. They are just part of the activities organized by MID in alignment with its vision in ensuring the ongoing process of improving the sustainability of our built environment. Because project management for interior fit-out may involve anything from commissioning the entire project to selecting materials and buying individual products. Interior designers, project managers, architects, engineers, procurement advisors, and others who play a part in organizing, designing, and construction of projects have important roles in helping to ensure a healthy and environmentally sound interior environment. All products groups of interior refurbishment have their own respective level of environmental impacts 
associated with their source, manufacturing process, use, and disposal. And we have heard about results of the harmful effect that this material could have on us. We all live in what we call the built environment today, which means the sounding, surrounding in which we are living is in its created for humans, for by humans and to be used for human activity, which means that the environment needs to be created by taking into consideration people, places, and process. And the link between these three elements is the interior designers. Lifespan of interior fittings. The built environment is a changing constantly. Here are some insights. The building structure itself lasts an average of 50 to 70 years. The building services, for example, lighting and power circuit lasts an average of 15 years. Lifespan of interior fittings. The fixtures, lighting, partition, IT equipments last an average of five years. The space setting itself, such as your furniture in an office, may last for less than that. We can even say that they change weekly or even daily. Perimeters and limitation in designing interiors. Our surrounding is a material, spatial, and cultural product of human labor that combines physical elements and energy in forms for living, working, and playing. It's also defined as a human-made space in which people live, work, and recreate on a day-to-day -day basis. This space must be designed by taking a lot of important parameters in mind. Some of these parameters are layout and orientation, maximizing the sunlight, minimizing heat effect, especially in tropical countries. Space planning, critical, especially with the increasing challenge for space in urban areas. Energy consumption, also critical with the world's depleting energy resources. Equipment and technology, with the fast changing technology, there are also constant demand for change for the correspondent equipment. Choice of finishes, color, textures, also important, because as the quality of life improves, the human being is more demanding. There is also the question of identity, with this world getting smaller due to ever-evolving communication speed. Environmental comfort. This is the most important perimeter for designers. Environmental comfort refers to the range of temperature, air movement, and humidity conditions that most people will find comfortable most of the time. Environmental comfort is achieved when the environment provides the appropriate condition to avoid feeling too cold or too hot. Six factors influence human fact comfort, temperature, clothing, and wind speed, sunlight, humidity, and evap evaporative cooling. In tropical cl climate like ours, this is also linked to the air circulation and condition. While in other parts of the world, this is also linked with heating, even protection from glaring light in mountainous areas and sand like the desert areas. In these two photos, we see two ways of managing direct light. One in tropical, which is on the left side, and temperate climate. Psychological factors. Another important perimeter for designers. This refers to understanding user references preferences, taboos, needs, processes, etc., and being sensitive to the nuances. The hype term right now is empathic design, the user-centered design approach that pays attention to the user's feeling towards the design. The design process includes total immersion of the designers in the skin of the possible end users and even prototyping. Origin of the workplace now, let us look into the workplace itself, which is the case of my session this afternoon, the office. The first commercial offices appeared in the northern industrial cities of the USA in the late 19th century. With the invention of the telegraph and telephone, 
Offices could be situated away from the home or factory, and control could be retained over production, distribution to distant markets. Origin of the workplace, new technologies such as electric lighting, the typewriter, and the use of calculating machines allow large amounts of information to be accumulated and processed faster and more efficiently than before. By 1900, nearly 100,000 people in the US were working as secretaries, stenographers, and typists in an office. The average worker was employed for 60 hours per six-day week. Specialized training was then developed for people who wished to study office skills. The open office arrived when architects had started to use cast iron girders to open up large spaces within a building. In the American industrial boom of the late 19th century, the bosses jumped at the chance to replace, re replicate their factory lines with those of the office worker. So we end up, ended up with clerical workers set at small desks in straight rows, often facing the same way, while higher ranking executives at larger spaces. Origin of the workspace. And these trends continue to till today. Works place of today trends. When we talk about the office space of today, these are the values that are voiced out again and again by employees, space planners, and designers. Collaborative work. The workplace of today must have a unique character with an appropriate image and identity, inciting a sense of pride, purpose, and dedication for the individual and the workplace community. Mobility, it also needs to be easily adaptable, various work strategies, and help balance the individual work and home life. Changing technology, the workplace must come with technology, systems, and furnishing that could accommodate organization change with minimal time, effort, and waste. Workplace of today, the challenges, retaining the work environment that companies have provided for the past half century are increasingly unsuited to emerging patterns of work and are inhibiting workers from performing to their full potential. Some of these challenges are retaining talents. Today's generation of workers expect adaptable office environment with high tech features. Up to three generations of Three generations, generation working together, baby boomers, generation X and gen Y. Allowance for the future, the workplace today needs to accommodate rapid organizational changes and more progressive work styles and cultures. So in this highly competitive global business and with this chaotic work environment, organization need to increasingly revisit the workplace strategies to offer the best values. Workplace must go beyond simple function and aesthetic to become almost like strategic business tool that supports emerging work practices and organizational culture. The ideal workplace. We can almost resume that the ideal workplace is a combination of several parameters. The most important being work strategy, space, and culture. Since employee account for the majority of, ag of an agency expenses, the workplace impact on employee productivity has been widely studied and acknowledged as a significant contributor to the employee satisfaction. Current res research shows and leading businesses agree that the workplace significantly influences employee satisfaction, health, hiring, retention, and productivity. Innovative workplaces are cost-effective, flexible, and sustainable work environments that support organizational change and collaborative work styles. The end goal of an innovative workplace is to provide high-performance work environments that maximize worker productivity and reduce long-term operating expenses. The Green Building Index Interior Tools. which brings us to the Green Building Index. The GBI Interior Tools is created combining the concepts of sustainable design, development, and maintenance to produce a sustainable workplace that respects the environment, improves health and performance, 
maximize human capital, supports an efficient organization, makes the best use of resources. To the GBI Interior Tools, we hope that stakeholders would be able to create and have better built interior environment that can gain better values in the market, both in terms of economics and social standard. It offers suggestions to help with the task to the practical checklist in its assessment criteria. Contents on the GBI interior tools are drafted with the objective to assist stakeholders in making sustainable decisions when undertaking interior design works. The GBI interior tool was launched on the 12th of September to this year, and MID is proud to announce that the MID Secretariat shall be one of the pilot projects. The GBI interior tool details simple guidelines that comes with corresponding proposed ideal statistic and measurement to increase the energy efficiency of interiors, develop sustainable procurement practices, develop water conservation practice, develop waste management procedures, facilitate shifts in behavior management, and develop a green interior self-assessment and monitoring guides. It also offers possibility to improve the environmental performance of existing building. GBI Interior Tools Procedure. GSP encourages all members of project teams, building owners, developers, and other interested parties, including contractors, government design and build contractors, to use the Green Building Index to validate environmental initiatives at the design phase of a new construction or base building refurbishment or construction and procurement phase of buildings. Use of the Green Building Index is encouraged on all such projects to assess and improve the environmental attributes. The criteria listed in these two can even be used as guide for the project's specification. Use properly this manual could help detail simple guidelines to increase the energy efficiency, develop sustainable procurement practices, develop water conservation practices, develop waste management procedure, facilitate shifts in behavior management, and even develop a green office cell assessment monitoring and reporting guide. However, the use of the GBI index two without formal certification by independent accredited GBI certified does not entitle the user or any of the party to promote the GBI rating achieve. No fee is payable for such use, however, formal recognition of the GBI rating and the right to promote same requires undertaking the formal certification process offered by Green Building Index Sandrian Bahad. GBI and two individual item score definition. These are the indi individual item score. We can observe they are all interconnected. For example, by reducing the level of electricity used in the office environment, you are directly reducing air and water pollution from power station and saving a ton of greenhouse gas for each 1,000 kilowatt hour of electricity you save. Now I'm going to share with you some of the individual item score for the GBI interior tools. The energy efficiency, for example, there's some very good reason for making your office an energy efficient, environmental sustainable work environment. The International Energy Agency has compiled statistics that show for the copier alone consume about 10% of the office environment electricity demand, and more than 90% of the energy consumed when copiers are not in use, which is one of the reasons why the GBI Intuit tools is according to the largest score for energy efficiency, 28 points out of 100 points. Individual item score priorities. Another example, all of us would be familiar with various studies showing how improved indoor air quality can boost an employability to perform mental tasks requiring concentration, calculation, and memory. As such, the GBI entry tools accorded 19 points for indoor environment quality. Future provisions. Ultimately, the best way to reduce all the environmental impacts of a space is to ensure that decisions are made holistically. In any project where a new building or refurbishment is being considered, 
is best achieved through an integrated design process that includes environmental management in construction and during operation. This last individual item score allows the strategy towards its objective, while the previous individual item score are mainly based on outcome-based approach, which measure the actual consumption of resources and environmental impacts of the space in operation. The score for innovation as a design-based approach which seeks to measure the future performance of the said space. GBI Interior 2, Stakeholders Responsibility. From time to time, the office environment used to need to change organizations and units expand and contracts. Function changes, furnishing wears out. Typically, an office fit out or refurbishment may involve all or some of these changes. Removal and replacement of walls, ceiling and floor coverings. Rewiring, installing new fixtures, fitting, furniture, equipment and appliances. The, the work shall involve many stakeholders, owners, users, designers, architects, engineers, suppliers, builders, contractors, etc. Each of them plays a part in organizing and designing the office environment and have important roles in helping to ensure a healthy and environmentally sound office environment. All of them need to take sustainable decision when undertaking this type of work. So here are a few steps that project stakeholders may want to consider. One, establish a vision that embraces sustainable principles and integrated sustainable design approach. Develop a clear statement of intent for the project visions, goals, design criteria, and priorities. Encourage all staff to participate in the project from the beginning. Offer information, training, and incentives to get their participation, and buy in to the project's visions and intent. Appoint a project manager who will be responsible for overseeing the project's planning and implementation. If internally appointed, which is often the case, ensure enough of time and effort is dedicated to the projects. Develop a, a project budget that incorporates building measures, seek sponsorship or grant opportunities, and allocate adequate funds for specific, specific sustainable options. Develop a project schedule that allows time for the investigation of sustainable issues, including time for the building system testing and commissioning. Adapt the tender selection process to select a design and construction team that is committed to the project's vision and has sustainable building experience. Build effective relationship with all team members, architects, designers, contractors, suppliers, there's a common understanding of your vision and aims. Make environmental issues an agenda item in meetings with all stakeholders. Use space planning and other material efficiency strategies to reduce the amount of building materials needed and to cut construction costs. Facilitate recycling collection and solid waste management by allocating space for these activities. Once commission ensures all building systems are operating at or above the optimum design efficiency ratings. Use the opportunity to add sustainable practice to the organization other activities. Focus on the big picture by looking for ways that will make the largest impact. Design and fit out choice should, over the life of the building, address the key issues of location, energy, water, materials, and waste. Conserve water energy. This includes the embodied energy in the raw material used during the fit-out or refurbishment as well as on the ongoing operation of the building. Water is also used in manufacturing as well as for amenities within the building. In Malaysia, the use of water and energy is mainly limited only to costs. While the control the use of energy is to some extent Water is generally inexpensive. Conserve water during the operation of the building, also save energy. 
example, used in pumping for distribution, heating for provide hot water, and treatment and disposal of wastewater. Minimize impact on indoor air quality. Staff can spend at least eight hours a day in the office. The quality of the air they breathe is important to both short-term and long-term health. Paint, carpets, furniture, and other office items can release volatile organic compounds, formidehyde, and other emissions, as well as exposing staff to toxins and allergens. Health and safety, occupational health, and other building regulation may also be relevant here. Minimize the use of toxic and hazardous materials. Hazardous, hazardous solid, liquid, and gaseous bases are produced during manufacture, as well as the end of the life of the product. These bases can be minimized or sustainable alternative are specified during the projects, which goes back to the importance of a thorough tender selection process discussed earlier. Reduce water, reuse, recycle, and minimize. Waste is created at all stages of a fit-out refurbishment, manufacturing products, building processes and operations, and disposal. Reducing waste as a source means deciding if you actually need a product at all, looking for a way in which to reuse existing products, getting more from less. Using recycled products is also likely to use less energy and fewer valuable raw materials than buying new. Use renewable, sustainable harvested natural materials and consider biodiversity protection. Wood is the main natural material used in office fit out. But the manufacture of vinyl flooring or aluminum cladding relies on scarce material, minerals. Use product with certification from organizations such as the Malaysian Timber Council or the American Hardwood Export Council or local indigenous sources. Minimize pollution of air, land, and water. Pol pollutants can produce at all stages of the life cycle of a product or building. Minimize the risk by ensuring product specification legal compliance and practice standards are met during the installation, operation, maintenance, and disposal of the products. Encourage environmental stewardship by suppliers and manufacturers. Some manufacturers are prepared to take responsibility for the environmental impacts of their products throughout their manufacture, distribution, operation, maintenance, and disposal. You can help promote this approach by asking for details of product composition, manufacturing processes including energy and waste use, package take-back schemes and disposable options, and using this information when deciding between different products. Ensure durability. A durable product with an extended life is generally more resource efficient. Look for quality products with replaceable or upgradable parts. You may need to balance this against other factors, such as the inclusion of materials with high adverse environmental impact. Simple guidelines, office partitioning. If we look at what is happening inside an office space, we will notice that material, equipment, or finishes may be more present than the rest. For example, let us take a look at office partitioning. Office separator panel used to take tremendous space in terms of surface and volume in older offices. This is due to the followed by steel and aluminum. Avoid using treated timber where possible for a purely internal partitioning system. Use formaldehyde-free particle board. Partitioning systems that include recycled materials are now available, as well as ones using material with very low embedded energy, such as bamboo. Use these where practicable. Simple guidelines, cabling and wiring. Another delicate component to deal with in an office is the cabling. How many times have you all ended up seeing cables around but not knowing what it's for? 
some of the points that may help. Designed for easy access and future removal. Install wiring in readily accessible wiring cases to simplify future modification. Minimize wire runs designed for future wiring needs, but avoid installing wires unless there is an immediate need for them. Reduce material use by installing high capacity runs to local hubs rather than connecting each directly to a central hub. Local hubs can connect to workstation while wireless or short wired connections. I'd like to go into more detail into lighting because other than the HAVAs, HAVC, lighting takes the biggest out of electricity bill. Some point I can share. <clears throat> Plan your lighting carefully. Look for opportunity to maximize natural lighting by placing offices in the area that get the most natural light. Placing open plan office around the building perimeter maximizes daylight. Cellular offices block out the light to other areas. Place cellular office and meeting rooms near the core or middle of the building so they don't block light. Work out how the office is going to be used and then allocate areas by general lighting to eliminate the office. The green star guide is 400 lux for here. Task lighting for desk or workstation to localize light to where and where it's really needed. Accent lighting, if required to create mood or to highlight a feature. Be economically and accent lighting is generally isn't if efficient to run. Install a lighting control system. Timers that switch lights off when the preset period are a suitable solution in open plan office a large conference room where it's difficult to make a particular individual responsible for turning off lights. Occupancy sensors are another solution. These sensors turn off lights when they're not detected, movement for around 15 minutes. Daylight dimming controls can be very cost effective over time. Ask your electrical engineers about the digital addressable lighting interface and similar systems. Ensure that switching to individual areas provided and labelled so that during after hour use, a whole floor doesn't need to be switched on. Simple guidelines on ventilation and cooling systems. Lastly, i like us to look into the most delicate aspect, the HVAC system. But again, we in Malaysia are very fortunate to have such a good and moderate weather. Maximize natural ventilation. This is easy for us in Malaysia, if possible. Have windows that open so that we can naturally ventilate the office. If this is not an option, make sure that the air quality is regularly assessed to avoid sick building syndrome. Insulate your office. I know that this is not common in Malaysia. Ensure the building is properly insulated above building code requirements. Insulation will save energy and provide a healthier, more comfortable environment. Most heat is lost through the ceiling, 42%. The rest through windows, which is 12%, cracks, 12%, or the floor, 10%. Don't let engineers over-specify HVAC equipment. Conservative approaches often lead to 30% excess capacity in HVAC plant which creates enormous ongoing inefficiencies. <clears throat> Ask your engineers how they decided on the HVAC plant side and test their assumptions. If possible, retain existing system or duct work, but ensure all air duct is clean to remove dust, dirt, and more before occupation. Don't skim commissioning. Time overruns may mean essential testing and balancing of the HVAC is not done until the building is occupied. This can lead to unbalanced and inefficient HVAC system. A building needs to be tuned over a year's running to ensure all systems are operating properly and in all climatic conditions. The future, uh, with all the tips, let's see what the future reserves for us when it comes to the office layout and the workplace environment. Every time we read about the future of work, we can see that the discourse is almost entirely on remote work. 
virtual workplaces and stories of people working from coffee shops? Yes, overall, this is rapidly growing trend. What we need to realize is that overall number is still quite small. According to Global work, Workplace ana Analytics, state of teleworks in the US and based on the US Consensus Bureau, the total number being worked solely from home is still only around 3 million. On the other hand, those who work only part of time from home or on the road are estimated to be much as 45% of all the jobs in the US. So the idea of organization with most of the employees working from practically anywhere they want is still a distant vision for the broader economy. More accurately, the idea of significantly virtual organization with no need for office space or everyone sitting in a co-working space is not a reality for the majority of companies and it won't be for a while, if ever. While you need to support more remote workers, the hybrid office plus work scenario will continue to be the biggest concern for office, IT and HR managers. The pros and cons of what this does for employee aside, consider the complexity in managing resources for such situation. As we work to the hybrid scenario, the types of resources and its physical location may change, but the need does not. More likely, we should count on an increased need to track and manage the resources as they become more mobile. Let us take a look at some of these needs. Some visuals here. Thank you. 